This is really weird. <laughs> well, let me introduce you. As you know, this is Tommy James, and this is Martin Fitzpatrick, who wrote the book with Tom. Okay, folks. Tell us a little bit about that guitar. Tom. This is gonna. This was the actual guitar that was uh, on the front of the book. Oh. That's what they tell me. Anyway, how is everybody? Does this work? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Um, boy, this is the first time I've ever done this. Um, first book I've ever had anything to do with. Martin was brilliant, but I was uh, a novice. Um, I, I hope you enjoy the book. I hope uh, it's as good to you as it was to me. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the book is essentially an autobiography, and um, uh, we actually began to write it uh, as Crimson and Clover. We were going to just do a music book, and uh, little by little as we uh, uh, got about halfway through, we realized that we were only telling about half the story. And so we had to uh, stop dead in our tracks and we put it on the shelf for a little bit because we knew we had to uh, tell the, uh, I guess you could say the dirty side, which was uh, the story of Roulette Records and not just the music. And uh, Roulette was the uh, label that uh, we were signed to. And uh, we had a lot of great success at Roulette. Uh, Roulette was a, uh, actually a, a very fine uh, functioning record company, independent record label here in New York, but they were uh, also a front for the Genovese crime family and um, uh, uh, lots of hanky-panky going on there. <laughs> um, everything from money laundering to um, a social club and all the uh, characters uh, used to hang out there that we'd see on TV. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the, the stories we tell in the book is how we slowly came to realize what roulette was. Um, uh, now the fellows that we would meet up in Morris Levy's office, Morris Levy was the uh, president of Roulette Records. And um, we would meet characters up in his office and we'd shake hands and and uh, leave, and two weeks later, we'd see them being uh, taken out of a warehouse in New Jersey in handcuffs. And say, isn't that the guy we just met at Morris's office? And it was. <laughs> so little by little, we, uh, we realized what we were into. And um, so essentially, uh, uh, the book tells the story of us having uh, hit records with... Uh, you know, Moni Moni, and I think we're alone now, and Crimson and Clover, and also this very dark side and scary side that um, was certainly true. Um, getting paid was uh, like taking a bone from a Doberman. Uh, it was not fun, it was always confrontational, and there was always this very real threat um, behind everything that happened that if you uh, 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 gripe too much or uh, talk too loud or really pissed anybody off, you could end up like Jimmy Rogers very easily, who was left for dead. He was a roulette artist on, a, uh, on an L.A. freeway. And um, so there were so many... Um, uh, I, I don't mean to be hogging the thing up here. Martin can talk, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> there were... Um, so many signs, really, that uh, uh, should have been more obvious to us. We really didn't care that much because all we wanted were hits. But uh, basically, uh, my first record, Hanky Panky, was recorded when I was in high school, um, uh, a junior in high school in Niles, Michigan, my hometown. And the record um, was released uh, in Niles in the vicinity around there when I was that age and it was uh, number one in about six blocks and then died a miserable death right there and uh, so we kind of forgot about the record i graduated from high school in 1965 and i took my band on the road through the midwest playing clubs and right in the middle of our one of our clubs in janesville wisconsin in april of 66 um, 
uh, the club closed, the IRS shut him down and sent us home. And so I was very dejected and depressed and went home. And, but that's how the good Lord works because uh, uh, if I hadn't gone home at that moment, I would have never gotten the call from Pittsburgh. I got a, I got a call about uh, three days after I got home from a uh, record distributor in Pittsburgh telling me that Hanky Panky was sitting at number one in the city of Pittsburgh and was the biggest record Pittsburgh up to that point had ever had, biggest single. And um, we couldn't believe it. Um, they bootlegged 80,000 records and sold them in 10 days, and we were sitting truly at number one, right? Uh, only in America could this happen. So uh, I went to Pittsburgh uh, and uh, picked up the first bar band I could find. They were called the Racon Tours, and they were very, very talented, and they became the Shondells because... Uh, by the way, Shondells was the name on the record. And um, so uh, two weeks later, we went to New York and really were thrilled and had a regional breakout in the trade papers and went to all the record companies and got a yes from everybody. We got a yes from Columbia, uh, Epic, RCA, Lori, remember Lori Records? And uh, Kama Sutra, remember them? And so <laughs> we... The last place they took the record to was uh, Roulette Records. And um, so uh, we were just thrilled. And the next day, one by one, all the companies called up and said, uh, listen, we got a pass. Um, it was, what do you mean? We had a deal. Said, no, no, no. We, Jerry Wexler finally from Atlantic admitted what had happened, and that is that... Uh, uh, Morris Levy from Roulette Records had called all the other record companies and said, this is my record. <laughs> so we were apparently going to be on Roulette Records, and uh, we were. And that's how it began. And um, so the book tells this story in, in great detail, actually, because this was a real important moment in my life. And... Um, uh, gradually how we had to put a production team together and, and uh, we followed Hanky Panky up with, uh, of course, the album and then Say I Am, uh, It's Only Love and then I Think We're Alone Now. And uh, the people that we met and, uh, you know, there's, the one thing about this book is this mixed bag of feelings because there's such elation on one hand because of the wonderful things that were happening in music and then really, uh, at the same moment, uh, great fear and um, uh, concern about uh, what was happening uh, behind the scenes there. And uh, it wasn't just about getting paid either. It was about the day-to-day -day things that uh, um, we seemed to have no control over. And so we were walking on eggshells a great deal of the time. And... Um, really had to mind our P's and Q's because uh, things got scary up there several times, very scary. And uh, we were very, very blessed and fortunate to uh, make it out in one piece. Uh, gradually, uh, as time went on, uh, different things happened. Uh, we, we go into detail about um, uh, some of the activity. Uh, we, we would, uh, for example, Vito Genovese died Valentine's Day uh, of 1969 and uh, the reason that was important is because these were Genovese people, <laughs> real simple. And um, uh, they began having a lot of meetings up at Roulette um, concerning what was going to happen and who was going to be his successor. And um, as it turns out, it turned out to be Morris Levy's business partner. Tommy Eveley was his name. and. Um, he was already the acting boss of the family uh, under Vito Genovese while he was in prison, but now he became his successor. And uh, what happened up Roulette as a, as a result? And then a terrible mob war broke out in 1971. You may remember it in the newspapers. Uh, hundreds uh, of, of people, of, of mob guys were, uh, were killed because the Gambino family was taking over New York. And um, uh, at that moment, uh, of course, Morris was on the wrong side, and things up at Roulette were really nuts. And um, uh, so I won't, I won't tell you any more about it, except that as, 
uh, uh, these people would come up to Morris's office, he would introduce me to some of these people, and it was very scary, and I constantly had to weigh whether uh, it was worth it staying there because we were having hits as opposed to all of the problems that, uh, uh, that happened as a result of, of, of there being mob tied. So this is the first time I've, I've, I've talked about it. It was very, very therapeutic for me. Uh, Martin was brilliant, by the way, I gotta tell you. Uh, we banged this out basically at my kitchen table and uh, Martin, um, who by the way is a very skilled writer, uh, uh, wrote a book and not too long ago about the bitter end. You remember the bitter end nightclub? So he's 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 been doing rock and roll for a long time, and um, uh, but when we began to write this, um, he he had a philosophy, and that was that uh, the book starts off sort of like a train pulling out of the station, and it gets. Uh, develops a head of steam more and more as, as the book goes on. And finally, by the, by the end of the book, it's really riveting. And he stuck to that. So we had to edit ourselves a lot. There's a lot of stories we couldn't tell because uh, we just flat out didn't have enough time. We would have bored everybody. Uh, but I, and uh, by the way, I'm so glad to have, there's Herbie Rosen right there. Herbie Rosen was, uh, I just <laughs> One of the greatest uh, independent promotion men in the record business. He literally owned New York during the 90s. Ah, it's was How are you? Um, we have, oh, we, uh, I, I, we have a few of the roulette people uh, left. And um, I must say, uh, I cherish these folks. Um, we hang out together. We... We do things, and, and it's, uh, this is a wonderful time uh, in all of our lives, but particularly because we get to tell this story. And I was always uncomfortable telling this story until the last of the, uh, last of the bad guys kind of passed on. So uh, anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and uh, I, I really hope you enjoy this thing. And something to say. Okay. I think, oh, oh. This afternoon, I got an email from Here's the mic. Tommy Eboli's nephew. Mr. Eboli was one of the people that he talks about in the book. And he said he read the book and he was he was a very he, he wanted to thank Tommy for being kind to his uncle in the book. <laughs> so there are, you know, some relatives that are still around, but ultimately. <laughs> so I wanted you to know that. I'm not nearly as brave, though, as, uh, as you might think. I did wait till they passed on. So. Um, anyway, I'd like for uh, Martin to say hi. And, um, Hello, everybody. Hi, Martin. You can use this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was very lucky to get a chance at this because this, uh, the deeper I got into it, the realized that this was a, I couldn't have written a better fictional story. Everything worked as, and that, I think that's why it's so exciting because it reads like a novel. When um, Tommy first came to New York, Morris was up here. He was at the top of his game. He ran the music business, ran it like the sixth family. Uh, we said there was the Colombo family, the Gambino, the Gen Genovese, and then there was the Roulette family. And he ran the music business that way. And Tommy was down on the bottom, if you will, of the circle. He was a young, uh, innocent, naive kid, I guess that's not unfair to say, <laughs> coming, to, uh, <laughs> coming to New York. And uh, Morris and Tommy connected like this. And through the course of the book, movement begins to happen, if you will. I'll just say this. It goes like this, almost. Tommy starts to get more secure. Morris starts to fade in that respect. And bit by bit by bit, they meet as equals. That's a very crucial point in the book. It's when Tommy takes control of uh, his life gets out of roulette, and that's that clash. After that, things begin to change. Roulette goes downhill. Tommy remarries, goes to Betty Ford, 
He starts to get his royalties and his money back. Morris gets arrested, convicted, gets cancer. And by the end of the book, the entire arc of the story has changed. It's Tommy that's up here and Morris is down here. But there's still that connection. And they, the two of them can't let it go. And I just thought that was a marvelous... Uh, just a marvelous story by <coughs> anybody's standards. And this is true, and of course, it's filled with uh, probably the best time in popular American music. You can't beat the 60s and 70s. <laughs> Looking at it that way is also what um, the Hollywood people and the theatrical people who have expressed great interest in this book, we're also looking at too. And uh, with any luck, I guess you can go into that. Sure. There's going to be uh, extracurricular activity on the book, right? Well, uh, that's true. And by the way, that was beautifully said. I, I, I hadn't thought of that, but that's exa you're exactly right. That is how, how it felt. And um, we've been very blessed and fortunate because uh, uh, it's going to be a movie, and it's going to be a Broadway play. And we're just, I, I can't tell you, thank you. I can't tell you how wonderful that feels. And uh, uh, honestly, uh, this is going to be the greatest uh, time of our lives, I think. I think the next two, three years are going to be really amazing. And uh, as I said, this was so therapeutic because it's something that, I certainly have been wanting to tell for a long time, and I think once we got into it, I think Martin feels the same way. Uh, that this was important to, to get off my chest, and uh, um, I really do believe that uh, we're gonna have a great time in the next couple of years. So thank you, everybody, and God bless you, and thanks for coming. I'm sure there's a hundred things I've left out, but at any rate, I uh, hope we get a chance to say hi to you. Thank you very much. Right, sorry. <laughs> I knew there was something I forgot. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve Allen said that uh, it was nightclubs also that were uh, uh, mob run, and for a while he couldn't get work in nightclubs. Uh, first of all, would you say that's true? And uh, second of all, uh, what about uh, the present and the future as far as mob connections with either the record industry or nightclubs? Well, you know. Um, the, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, nightclubs and jukeboxes and vending machines were all mob controlled at one time uh, because it was very street level business. So was the record business. Um, things have changed a lot, kind of like Vegas. Uh, uh, basically, the, uh, uh, the music business, the record business, of course, really, we're, we're talking about a business that doesn't exist anymore. Um, even uh, the CD business is pretty much over. The, the widget business has been replaced by digital downloads and music, and of course that's going to change everything. Um, there's no middlemen anymore. So uh, uh, that really will stop most of the activity, I think. Although, who knows, the entertainment business has always been fertile ground for uh, the mob, and I'm sure they'll be involved in it some more. Uh, but um, the funny part is that uh, mob stories are sort of like cowboy stories. They're the new westerns, you know, and people are fascinated with this stuff. Um, uh, I know why. By the way, uh, Hesh Rabkin on The Sopranos, you know, Hesh was, mo was Moish. They called him Moish, Morris Levy. And uh, they obviously had a resident wise guy on The Sopranos, too. <laughs> so, uh, and... Uh, uh, Tony Soprano was also modeled after Tony Salerno, who was one of the uh, the boys that used to hang out at Roulette. So, um, you know, it's going to. I I don't think the mob is going to have the kind of connections uh, that they did at the in the record business. But believe me, they'll be in the entertainment business. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, uh, I know there's some live recordings of your recent bands and stuff, but is there any that we can hear from the original Sean? Sure, you know, the original Shondells and I are back in the studio together. Wow. And <laughs> that's true. I forgot to tell you that. Um, although I've been touring with uh, 
sort of the new group of Shandells. At our book release party, we had both groups on stage at once. It was really a kick. We're back in the studio. We actually made a couple of tunes for the movie. Um, uh, one looks like it's going to be closing credits. Things are just a new version of I Think We're Alone Now. And um, uh, not at all like the original version. Uh, uh, very sedate and uh, slow and sort of singer-songwriter. And it uh, just came out beautiful. And I, I, you know, we're going to release it as a single as it gets closer to the movie. But thanks for asking. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. All right, first, thank you for all the fun. Great oh, music. thank you. Yeah, you. My for parents not. hated Crimson and Crow. Hated it. Which part did they hate the worst, Ian? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what other bands were signed on by Roulette? Roulette was an interesting uh, array of people. It started out, uh, the label was formed in 1956. And I must say, uh, uh, Morris Levy, uh, who started Roulette, uh, was really ahead of his time in some ways. I mean, the whole, he had a publishing company. He owned Birdland, the most famous jazz club in history. He managed Alan Freed and uh, pretty much George Goldner, who was the third partner, and um, had this amazing array of artists starting. Roulette started with... Uh, uh, Jimmy Bowen and Buddy Knox, who were in the same band. And that was uh, Party Doll by uh, Buddy Knox, and I'm Sticking With You was their first single by Jimmy Bowen, who was Buddy's bass player. And uh, those were their first two singles, and then they uh, got Jimmy Rogers, uh, Honeycomb, and Secretly, and uh, Kiss Is Sweeter Than Wine, and a whole bunch of uh, really great records. He was a very talented artist. And um, then moving on, I'm leaving, oh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, and there was a movie made about them. And of course, Morris was famous for putting his name on other people's songs, you know, that was one of the first things that he got busted for. And you know, Morris almost, uh, almost trademarked the term rock and roll. I mean, came within a hair's breadth of pulling that off. And... Um, uh, can you imagine if somebody would have done that, or the money that would, well, anyway, since chills up my spine. Uh, then uh, moving on to 1960, it was Joey D and the Starlighters, and uh, of course the Peppermint Twist, and oh, they did a cover that was a, of the Isley Brothers Shout, it was huge, and uh, uh, several other hits, and really, the, but the Peppermint Twist was, was gigantic, Morris made a movie, and uh, uh, then moving on to, uh, he, he then uh, ended up with all of George Goldner's labels, End, Gone, uh, Rama, Tico, uh, ended up with Little Anthony and Imperials, and the Flamingos and the Chantels and the doo-wop stuff that had been on George Goldner's labels because George Goldner had a uh, gambling problem and he would um, end up losing uh, vast sums of money, and Morris would bail them out and then take his record labels. So, uh, Morris ended up with an, uh, an incredible number of artists because of that. And then, uh, moving on, he had Lou Christie. He had uh, the Essex, Easier Said Than Done, and, and Walking Miracle, and a couple of others. And then we came along. He uh, did not have a major hit record. The Hullabaloos. Remember the Hullabaloos? Uh, and uh, so one of the things that made Roulette so attractive to me was that they really needed us. Um, if we had signed with a corporate label, uh, a Columbia or an RCA or, you know, one of the bigger labels, we probably would have been handed a producer, and that's probably the last thing anybody would have heard of us because of the fluky nature of our first hit. But at Roulette, they really needed us, and so we were allowed to spend as much money in the studio as we needed. We were left alone, which was very important, uh, to sort of morph into whatever we could become. So I was very grateful for that. And, uh, you know, it made it awfully hard to leave from a creative standpoint. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thanks again for the music. Oh, um, thank you. It's probably apocryphal, and I haven't read your book, but uh, I remember growing up with hearing stories of Morris Levy or one of his henchmen 
holding an artist by their ankles out of window, out, right? out of the window, <laughs> and you can still open the windows in Manhattan skyscrapers. Right. You you either depress or you go to sign. This <laughs> is. Well, I heard that story too. I don't know. It's hard. I, 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 that never happened to me, thank God. Uh, but um, uh, I, I don't know. I certainly wouldn't have put it past him. Uh, Herbie, you were there at that meeting, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Herbie's never gotten over his fear of height. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Herb Rosen was one of the greatest promotion men in the, in the universe. Um, Promoted all of our records and uh, really was uh, responsible for so many hits, I can't tell you. Anyway, thank you, Herb. Yes, sir. What was it like to try to be a creative artist and at the very same time know that you couldn't bump into the wrong person the wrong way in the hallway? Right. Well, what was that? How did, how did you balance that? It was difficult. It really was. Uh, you know, the funny part was I actually spent a lot of time up at Roulette. Uh, Working with Red Schwartz, uh, who was the in-house promotion man, and Norman Kurtz, the uh, uh, lawyer up there, who was putting all kinds of overseas deals together. So it was creatively, it was wonderful. There was just, you know, if you stayed out of Morris's office, chances are it'd be okay. Um, the real problems came when, uh, uh, you know, they'd have meetings up there, and. Uh, I'd always know when. I'd walk up into uh, Roulette and Red's office would be closed. And it was the only time Red ever shut his door was um, when the boys were having a meeting. And that really created a lot of tension and stress up there. And getting, trying to get paid also was, was uh, real interesting. And um, I, I would say that, that you know, uh, being as young as we were and uh, as giddy as the whole thing was, uh, we weren't paying as much attention to it as maybe we should have. I, I'm sure today I'd be a lot more paranoid. We were also smoking a lot of stuff and uh, <laughs> popping a lot of, you get it. So I, I honestly, uh, 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 I'm sure that had a lot to do with it and we were, uh, uh, Probably not as scared as we should have been. Yes. Big fan, many Thank years. Thank you very much. What struck me about the book that was really interesting was that despite all the drama, you guys really seem to be having a lot of fun and a great time. I mean, some of the stories in there, the one about the toupee getting yeah. out of fire, were it, fabulous. So I guess I want to know, how do you keep your sense of humor? Well, you know, um, one of the things that, that happened in the book as we wrote it was what we realized is what a mixed bag of emotions uh, we were having. Because it was like, you know, you, you, very schizophrenic of going from elation to fear or from, um, uh, you know, the normal stuff you would do on the road uh, to, um, uh, you know, just, all, just a mixed bag of feelings all the time. There was this whiplash feeling of going back and forth from emotions. And that's what we tried to convey in the book. I mean, the story is she's... Uh, talking about it uh, was uh, uh, we were in uh, uh, it was early on in our career and we were uh, uh, playing the 40 Thieves Club in uh, Bermuda and um, uh, we had just been the week before with Paul Revere and the Raiders out at uh, Malibu Beach uh, 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 doing where the action is you remember that with Dick Clark? and we watched Paul Revere and the Raiders uh, do this incredible thing Called, they called it a guitar fight. And, you know, they, they looked like pistons. The bass player, you know, Fang would, would drop down like this and they'd swing a guitar really hard over his head and he'd stand up and do the same thing back. And it was military precision. Of course, we went, we can do that. And um, so we tried it out at the 40 Thieves Club. And um, we, got a, we were doing it to Land of a Thousand Dances. And uh, we got about halfway through the song and the guitar fight started and all of a sudden boom! and I turn around and Joe Kessler, our guitar player, who wore a wig, his wig went right through the air like this, landed on a guy's candle on a table and burst into flames. <laughs> Couldn't have done that in 10,000 years. 
So uh, the guy at the end of the night says to us, uh, hey, I like the thing with the hair, man. Can you do that every show? I said, no, it's just something we do, you know, at the very beginning of a gig, kind of creates a buzz. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> anyway, thanks for asking. Yes, ma'am. Has the film been cast and what is it doing? No, we are in the, the very beginning stages of what's called pre-production. And uh, right now, a director is just going to be signed. They're talking with three different people. And um, uh, it's going to be a wonderful uh, bunch of people when it's done because they're, nobody is going to be a lightweight on this. And I just, I, I'm just so flabbergasted by this attention. Uh, I, all I, you know, they're going to let me maybe be a bartender or an elevator operator or something. <laughs> but I just cannot tell you how, how amazingly blessed I feel. I, I, I really can't. I, it's not phony. I really do mean that. Anyway. Sorry. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm actually owner for, for Martin I mean, you as well, but at, at one point you said earlier you started to write a, a music story. And that was your goal. And eventually you realized <laughs> we've got something different here. Uh, at what point did you realize we, we got something different here and we got to go in a different direction? What was kind of the funny fact? Well, the more that Tommy talked about Morris, we would go, you know, I would be moving in, in the direction how did how was this song created, that song created, and all of a sudden we get lost in Mars stories. We couldn't get away from Mars if we tried. And I, you know, that's when I think we both realized that th this is really the story. Uh, the, 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 the music is almost incidental. The, it's, it's, it's this thing that kept the, the pieces together. Um, and, you know, for me it was just a, you know, technically speaking, it, it afforded a lot of opportunities uh, in pacing, uh, like Tommy said, in the stories of the 50s and 60s before he gets to New York, it's a slower pace, more languid, easy, very little obscenity. Everything's morning in America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as soon as he gets into New York, the, 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 uh, there's actually more stories, but the chapters compress a little. And it gets a little faster. And before you know it, you, like Tom, your head's spinning. Because five things are going on all at once. And it's, it's always with that shadow of Morris. We couldn't escape it if we wanted to. So why not just give in? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I really enjoy your music. Thank you very much. Uh, two things. I thought Alan Freed coined uh, rock and roll? The phrase yes. Rock and roll. Oh, he did, but the other guy wanted to copyright yes. it. Oh. That's right. <laughs> the other thing is, um, I don't keep up with who goes into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Are you in there? With no. The no, <laughs> that's going to change. <laughs> I can't believe it. Madonna is in there. Well, yeah, uh, you know, it's. Um, oh, I've always taken a position when it's our time, we'll, we'll go. Uh, the Hall of Fame, by the way, is getting uh, very much involved with promoting this project. I'm, I'm just blown away by that. Uh, we'll be out there, as a matter of fact, uh, May 14th and 15th. We're going to be doing uh, a seminar, basically what we're doing right now, uh, questions and answers and that kind of thing, called Legends. And then the next night, we're going to be uh, performing out there. So it, it's, um, it's going to be... Uh, they've been very good to us. and. Uh, you know, last year they took my shoes, my boots. So my, my boots and my jacket were in, but, but I wasn't. <laughs> this year I think they get the whole package. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. Yes, sir. What, what's your favorite tune of all the tunes you did? What's that we did? Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, well, of the hits, I, I, I probably have to say Crystal Blue Persuasion. Yeah. Because, <laughs> thank you. It, uh, Crystal Blue, every time I hear it, really uh, takes me back to that magic summer of 69. Everything was working, and the Jets won, the Mets won, the Rangers won, the Knicks won. Um, we went to the moon, Woodstock. Every, in fact, it was, it was number one uh, during the week of Woodstock. And um, uh, honestly, uh, uh, it just reminds me, I can pretty much tell you what color clothes I had on when we made that record. Very hard record to make. Actually, we had uh, 
a lot of problems with it. Um, we, we really overproduced it. We had drums and guitars and, and percussion instruments on there, and it just wasn't the song we wrote. So we basically then had to unproduce the record and um, let it breathe a little bit until it had some atmosphere around it, and then, uh, then it lived. By the way, we, we, were, we went number one the week of Woodstock, and uh, uh, we were in Hawaii. And um, we had uh, two shows, uh, one at the beginning of, our, of two weeks and at the end of two weeks, and they put us up at the foot of Diamond Head at this uh, wonderful Spanish uh, villa mansion. It was just magnificent down there. And so our biggest concern of the day was whether to go swimming in the pool or in the ocean. And uh, so my secretary called uh, from a roulette. And um, on Monday of the last week, she said, listen, Artie Kornfeld, who was one of the, uh, he's a friend of mine, he was a producer, did the Cowsills and oh, a whole lot of other records. But um, he was one of the uh, promoters of Woodstock, one of the principals. And um, uh, she, Joanne said, listen, I, I already wanted to know if you'd come up and play a pig farm in upstate New York. And uh, they, I said, what did you say? She said, yeah, you know, it's going to be a big gig. And they said, there's going to be a lot of people up there. And I said, all right, well, I'll tell you, tell Artie that, you know, if we're not there, start without us. <laughs> and uh, hung up the phone. And by Thursday, we knew we screwed up really bad. <laughs> so, but I ended up getting more mileage out of the story, I think, than the, but anyway, we blew Woodstock. Yes, sir. No, sir, we're not. We're going to see if we can change. Huh? Well, we, we, we think that maybe in the next year or two, they're going to help us out with this uh, project. And, uh, well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, that was the follow-up to uh, I Think We're Alone Now. Do you know it was I Think We're Alone Now backwards? Isn't that a 60s story? That's a true story. We were all buzzed listening to the mix of I Think We're Alone Now. And back then, we got a seven and a half IPS reel-to-reel -reel tape. And we, if you had it on upside down, it played backwards. So we, we had it on upside down. The thing started to play. And it was backwards. And we went, hey, that's cool. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so Bo and Richie, uh, Bo Gentry and Richie called Cordell, went off in the corner and wrote it. And it turned out to be Mirage, and that was the very next record we did. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, your songs have been covered pretty successfully over the years. Is there, are there any covers that have really have blown you away and impressed you? Yes. Yeah, we've had, well, we've had over 300 cover versions of our songs done over the years, and I'm... I think it's great. I'm very honored and flattered when somebody uh, 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 does one of our old songs, keeps the music in front of people. And uh, uh, Actually, R.E.M. did a great job on uh, Dragging a Line uh, in, one of the, in the last Austin Powers movie, and I thought that was really... Prince just took Crimson and Clover to number one digitally. Did you know that? Um, he had a digital album this last year, and uh, it was the first time that was ever done and did a very futuristic version of Crimson and Clover that uh, uh, was really great. Tom Jones did I'm Alive last year from the uh, Crimson and Clover album, and that was really unexpected. And um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful with the, with the cover versions. How about Molly, 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 uh... Billy Idol, yeah. He did a good job. Kept the hard edges on it. We don't get paid for the dirty version, though. Yeah, that's true. That, that, uh, that was a true story. Moni Moni was, uh, uh, we were uh, just doing kind of a toss salad of every party rock song I ever heard. And um, uh, it was the night before we were supposed to do the vocals and we still had no title. And we're looking for a girl's name, two syllables, looking for Sloopy, Boney Maroney, something. And so Richie Cordell, my songwriting partner, and I were uh, at my apartment in 52nd and 8th in New York. And we uh, uh, throw our guitars down, go out on the terrace and light up a cigarette and just look up into the night sky. And the first thing our eyes fell on was the Mutual of New York building right down the street. 
M O N Y. <laughs> That's a true story. And we just started laughing because if we'd have been looking in the other direction, uh, we would have probably called it Howard Johnson's or <laughs> Equitable, maybe. Or... <laughs> so thank God for uh, neon signs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did you ever hear anything about how Bobby Fuller died? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was. That was. Uh, Pretty awful. He apparently, I remember I fought the law and the law won. Um, I actually had met him a couple of weeks before he died. He played a club in New York called The Phone Booth. And uh, um, uh, it's where the Rascals had started out, actually, year, a couple of years before that. And um, uh, he was a very nice guy with a gambling problem and got in over his head with somebody. And uh, the way I heard the story, they uh, got him in, at his own home and he made him drink gasoline or some god-awful thing and killed him. Yeah. Very sorry to uh, hear that. He was a great artist. Yes, sir. Sure. Do you think that Morris Levy's story will ever really be told? Well, I can only tell the parts of it that I know. You know, I can only tell the uh, parts of it that were at roulette. And, uh, uh, you know, the funny part about Morris Levy, the, 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 uh, he became the star of the story uh, simply because of who he is and, and uh, you know, the way things were. And uh, it was funny because it, we didn't mean to write it that way. That's just the way it came out. He and I sort of the ultimate odd couple. And... And it worked. Um, Morris was an amazing guy. Morris uh, died at 62. He uh, uh, ha had accomplished more in his life than almost any 10 guys I can think of. He was more fun than any 10 guys I can think of. It's just that uh, he was the way he was. And uh, I used to, you know, we used to talk. Uh, we, he'd take me up to his farm in upstate New York. We had a, he had a, 3,100 acre horse farm up there. Actually, it was a dairy farm and became a horse farm. And he and I would just, we'd get snifters of brandy and get loaded on a Friday night and, and just talk till 3, 4 in the morning. And I once asked him, I said, you know, you're a walking computer. Uh, you know more than, and then, than anybody you hang out. Why do you hang out with these guys? If I hadn't been loaded, I'd have never asked him that question. <laughs> And he wouldn't have answered me if he hadn't been left. He said, these are the people I know. And that was the most honest answer I ever heard. These were the people that I know. These, this was who he came off the streets with. And, um, uh, you know, it was a love-hate relationship. There's no doubt about it. And uh, when he died uh, in 1990, he died of cancer up at his farm. And uh, he had been convicted uh, of mob stuff, racketeering, you name it, and was sentenced to 10 years. And he never served a day because he died. And so, and I, the last scene in the book, in the movie, I, I presume, is uh, uh, I was playing a gig that night. I had just released a new album. And just as I'm leaving the house in the morning, I get word that uh, from our mutual friend, uh, uh, Howard Comart, uh, a, a mutual accountant, that Morris was asking for me and I needed to get up there right away. I said, as soon as I get back in the morning, I'm there. And he died that night. So I never got a chance to say goodbye to him and tell him, you know, how I felt. And that I was very appreciative of what he did. Uh, he, um, so the last scene in the book is I have this sort of imaginary conversation with him, what I would have said. I think, if uh, you know, uh, we if I had seen him, so that's how the book ends. Tell me you have time for two more questions. Sure. Yes, sir. Hi. Can I ask you how *Crimson and Clover* came about, and was it a real conscious effort to be part of the whole psychedelic thing? Well, *Crimson and Clover* actually, you know, turned out to be a, aside from our first record, probably the most important record we may, ever made, and the reason is. Um, 
uh, from a from a creative standpoint, it, it was a title that came to me as I'm wake in a dream, actually, just as I was waking up from from a dream, um, and I just they were just two poetic words. They, I wish they were profound. I just it just sounded like uh, two wonderful words that ought to mean something, and uh, so we tried our best to make them mean something. That really is the truth. We wrote two different versions of it. And uh, uh, and it ended up settling on the one that that we know. Uh, the reason it was so important is not just because it was our biggest selling record, but it was the moment when we decided to produce ourselves, write for ourselves, um, and and really uh, take the bull by the horns and sort of burn all the bridges uh, of having producers. Um, we had just gotten off the road with Hubert Humphrey. He actually re did the liner notes for the album. Um, uh, we had, uh, but when we left on the 68 campaign, um, we, uh, by the way, it was the first time a rock act and a politician ever teamed up together was, was that incredible election. And, and uh, we, we talk about it a great deal in the book. But uh, when we left, all of the acts that were popular were singles acts. It was the Rascals, it was the Association, it was the Buckinghams, us, Gary Puckett, and a handful of others. And when we got back, uh, it was all album acts. It was Blood, Sweat and Tears, Led Zeppelin, Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, um, Joe Cocker, Neil Young. And the world turned upside down uh, in that 90 day period. In late 68, there was this mass extinction of singles acts, and all album acts uh, came out of that. We were very, very fortunate because Crimson and Clover allowed us to make that transition from AM Top 40 to FM Progressive Album Rock, and I can't think of any other record we ever did that would have allowed us to do that. And so Crimson and Clover really became, uh, I guess, our second most important record that we ever made. And uh, um, by the way, just as you know, uh, the, uh, so you know, the um, uh, Crimson and Clover, we had this spectacular uh, beginning. We were gonna, we were gonna really uh, blow it out and promote it and Roulette was gonna do a whole number on it. I uh, had, took the, uh, the uh, a rough seven and a half uh, mix. I never got a chance to mix the record. I took it to Chicago and played it for John Brook, the uh, program director of WLS, biggest station in the country, ABC's sister station. And he, uh, unbeknownst to me, taped it. And so I said, you can't, now you, can't, you can never play this into, because Jim Stagg, the program director, WCFL, the other station that was, by the way, two big 50,000 watt stations going head to head. <laughs> Do you remember that? Um, and they were like two bulls. And uh, so I, w I was, we, we gave Money Money, by the way, before to, to uh, WLS, and Jim Stagg got very upset with us. So he told us, if this ever happens again, uh, you're done here. So I said, you cannot play Crimson and Clover. So the, I go downstairs as I'm getting back into the car, I hear, ah. <laughs> World exclusive. And so uh, Jim Stagg uh, sends a funeral wreath to Roulette Records, a six foot tall funeral wreath. Condolences on the death of Tommy James at uh, WCFL Radio. And we had to put out the rough mix because that's what John Rook was playing. He played it like every 20 minutes. And it broke out of Chicago, it was huge. But uh, we, I never got a chance to mix the record. It was the rough seven and a half that I had just thrown up the faders, you know. Never got a chance to put any. But I think that's God's way of saying, you've done enough, Tom. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Boy, that was a long story. Wasn't it? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one of my favorite songs of all time, not only just your catalog, is Tighter, Tighter by Alive and Kitty. Right. And was there a whole album that went along with that? Well, there was. I, did, I only produced a single. Um, uh, Tighter, Tighter was a song that uh, the Shondells and I uh, sort of parted ways in 1970. And I just took, we really were going to get together again. We just didn't. 
Um, and I took about six months off, and in that time I wrote Tighter Tighter uh, with Bob King. And um, uh, I took it in the studio. We had done the track. Jimmy Wisner, uh, 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 one of the, our production partners and arrangers, uh, did the horns and, and uh, uh, was in the track, basically, orchestrated it. And uh, I loved the track, but I hated the way I was singing it. I, it just didn't, wasn't coming out right. And uh, so I had remembered this group that, uh, uh, from Brooklyn that um, my wife's best friend managed. And um, uh, they were called Alive and Kickin', and they were playing clubs around the New York area. And uh, I brought them into the studio, rewrote it as a duet, and did it with them. And man, they just, they killed it. They nailed it. And they did a good job. They really did. And their guitar player then took that wild guitar solo. He was 17 years old. And I took it to roulette, and they put it out, and went number one almost overnight. And uh, so that was uh, that was a real neat. Uh, that was over Allegro, Allegro Studios, where we recorded. Yeah, sixteen fifty Broadway. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, in the sixties, there was like so many different bands and groups. What, like, what was your favorite other band that you maybe encountered or from that? Sure. I'd have to say, honestly, from a uh, creative standpoint, um, the group I, I loved the best, and we were cl very close, was the Rascals. Um, yeah. Uh, we were all great friends, and we, we competed with each other. You know, they were always one hit record ahead of us, and, and $5,000. They were always just ahead of us. They were like our older brothers, and... Um, uh, we became great friends, but very competitive. They were just down the street from, they were at Atlantic and we were at Roulette. There was about 20 feet between, uh, between the two record companies. And um, uh, I must tell you that when that band broke up, I was devastated. Um, even though they were our greatest competition, I felt. Um, I, I was, it was like losing family. We're all great friends to this very day. Felix and I are great pals, and we mention them in the in the book. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, I sure will. By the way, if you wonder why this great Gibson guitar is sitting here, this was the uh, actual guitar that was on the well, very close to the uh, one that is in this picture on the front. It's a a beautiful Gibson and. Uh, Gibson has been very good to us, by the way, over the years, and uh, um, I love Gibson equipment. I always have. We play it regularly, and I like the little gold pickups, don't you? <laughs> Comb my hair. He oh. doesn't have the shirt, though. <laughs> no, the, the, uh, I don't still have this shirt, by the way. I, I think I smoked it. I'm not <laughs> sure. Anyway, thank you very much, folks. God bless you.